Thank you, Martin. And uh, yeah, I, I also was reflecting on how over the last uh, nine years we've had a very international perspective coupled with the kind of energy and the entrepreneurship that we find here in Silicon Valley. And I think that's what's made the Industrialized Construction Forum a, a very unique uh, uh, event. Uh, but we've never really had anyone from Australia so far, uh, although we've had many different countries represented. Um, and so uh, this was an opportunity we had to invite our, our keynote speaker, Matthew Aitchison, who I will, I will invite up in a moment. Um, and Matthew is the CEO of uh, Building 4.0 CRC, and he's going to explain a little bit more about what that means. Uh, but from my perspective as an international researcher, it's one of the leading laboratories uh, that has a focus, a uh, leading, let's say, large research consortiums that has a focus on industrialized construction. The scale of it is quite massive. Um, and, uh, and in my opinion, um, it also represents something that's very familiar for those of you who have been around SIFI for a while, which is a collaboration between academia and industry in a very deep and meaningful way. That's my outside observation, so Matthew will have to see uh, you know, what, you, what you bring uh, today. Uh, he's also uh, was, was before that uh, uh, associate professor at uh, Monash University, um, and I don't think I need to say anything else. Your bio is online so people can read more, but uh, we'd like to welcome you up for our first keynote. Thank you, Matthew. Um, look, thank you so much uh, to everyone for the invitation to come and speak here. It's an absolute honour. I attended uh, this conference online last year and I told everyone in Australia about it uh, because it was so fantastic. Uh, I am aware that the title of this lecture is somewhat presumptuous, uh, especially sitting in a room here with so many experts uh, in the industry. But let me unpack it a little bit before we get going. Um, I would say that five years ago, I spent a lot of time and my teams uh, at the various universities spent a lot of time thinking about the, the top line of the title. What is the future? What does it look like? Um, what are its constituent pieces? But more recently, uh, I've spent a lot more time thinking about how to get there. And partly that's been derived from uh, a curiosity of our industry, I think which is that I often go around asking everyone whether they think we'll be doing things the same way uh, 20 years from now, and the resounding answer is always no, no, never, never. Of course, we are in complete agreement that we will not be doing things the same way. But when I ask them how are we going to get there, how are we going to transition, uh, I don't find any agreement at all. Uh, and I'm going to make the bold um, assumption here that if we did a poll around that we would agree, I think, as a group on around 80 to 90% on what those ingredients, to use a term that Yerka uh, introduced me to, we would agree on around 80 to 90% of the ingredients of what that future looks like. But the big unknown for me, uh, and one of the things that, that drives me in the work we do, is trying to understand that aspect of implementation and application of these different parts. And so today it won't surprise you if I'm the first person to speak here from Australia that uh, it's, it's worthy to talk a little bit about the Australian context. I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about our wonderful organisation, Building 4.0 CRC, which I hope will be of interest to you all. And of course, we'll move on to this uh, future of building uh, question. So let's start with the Australian context uh, and we'll move on from there. I think it's really important to understand about Australia the geography and particularly the pattern of urbanisation which has left its imprint on so many different aspects of Australian life. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Australia is comparable in size to the uh, USA. Uh, if you took out one or two states, it would be roughly exactly the same size. So most of the population is, as you can see, in the southeast of the country. Um, and as I say, one of the most popular, uh, one of the most industrialised countries in the world. Um, this led to uh, some very early building traditions that were um, very much influenced by geography, uh, where buildings were made and transported into the interior of the country, effectively to set up the extraction of those resources, and whether they be agricultural or, or, or mining resources. Moving into a more contemporary and globalised environment, uh, I would imagine that these are familiar scenes to everyone here. 
contemporary detached housing in Australia looks a lot like this. Um, Multi-storey housing looks a lot like this. A couple of industry statistics. Uh, I think uh, construction and property put together is approximately 13% of GDP in Australia. That's a very similar figure I would imagine to over here. It's a huge employer. Second largest employer in Australia if you put those two industries together, construction and property. Uh, the third point here I want to draw your attention to uh, because I'm going to come back to the industry structure in a second. 350,000 SMEs or small to medium enterprises in the construction industry registered in Australia, the vast majority of which are one and two person operations, meaning it is a highly fragmented industry of sub, 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 sub contracting. Uh, it's high cost, it's high wage, we have a massive housing affordability uh, and supply crisis just like uh, you do. Uh, sadly, I would say that prefab and modulum or industrialised building more generally makes up around 3% of the, the total market. However, that's really difficult to measure because we don't track those figures. Uh, and also, I think everyone here is aware of the problems in, in defining exactly what is an industrialised building product and what is not. So uh, this is the best figure we have, uh, but it's not a perfect figure. Uh, I would also say that we've been through some rather strange circumstances in Australia. Currently, we have record high, at least recently, inflation. We've got record low unemployment. Uh, we've got record rises in interest rates as central banks try to tamp inflation in our country. Uh, we are heading towards a prop uh, property market that is cooling, uh, undoubtedly. Exactly how much it cools and how quickly is not quite clear. Uh, and it's widely expected that this is going to lead to a mortgage crunch for a lot of uh, people in Australia uh, who are highly leveraged and deep in debt. Uh, my final slide on the overview of Australia, I want to say that we punch above our weight when it comes to building innovation. Um, Murray here is going to talk about PT Blink, uh, which is a company you see on the side. Uh, I'm happy to say that Lend Lease, Digital uh, and Donovan Group are both members of our CRC, which I'll introduce in a second. Uh, some of you would have obviously heard of Archistar. And, you might be wondering why I've got Oracle up as an Australian-based company, but it's because Aconex was begun uh, in Australia before it was sold uh, to, to Oracle. So I, I think this is a, a really tremendous result and shows you some of the quality we have in Australia. Now turning to our beloved uh, Building 4.0 CRC. Uh, I, I have to say what is a CRC? Uh, it is a cooperative research centre. It is the Australian government's largest and most long-standing research funding program. Uh, these, uh, uh, I should also point out that it is about industry-led research. So it's not about curiosity-driven research and it's not about uh, putting the universities in the centre. Uh, it is about industry-led research and as a result these tend to track to different industry verticals, whether they be mining and resources in Australia, a very important part of the economy, health, medical services, uh, agriculture is another really uh, popular topic for CRCs and of course uh, our areas which generally tend to fit within manufacturing technology in the built environment. One of the really interesting things uh, and uh, I would go a little bit wider than uh, CFE's um, interrelations with industry. The, the unique thing I think about a CRC in the Australian context is that it brings together research, industry and government. Ours goes just a couple of steps further in, in that we uh, deeply engage with peak bodies in Australia and we also engage with the skills and training organisations. Um, we occupy I think a really critical position on the uh, innovation uh, ecosystem. Uh, effectively bridging the gap between research and industry, between pure research and commercialisation. The main part of what we do is collaborative research projects with our partners. Uh, but we also, uh, and, and another key differentiator I would say of our CRC, is the fact that we attempt to do what we call lighthouse projects. These are projects that our partners and external partners are doing uh, that demonstrate innovative practices or they demonstrate the outcomes of the various collaborative research projects that we might do. And here on, this, on the screen you see some of the other 
really important activities we do, like educating PhDs and getting involved in regulation, uh, advisory, and so forth. Uh, all CRCs have a duration. Um, the minimum is five and the maximum is 10 years. We chose seven. Uh, we thought this was what would be palatable to our uh, consortium. Uh, they take quite a while to put together. Um, unfortunately, ours began right as COVID lockdowns began in Australia, which was rather harsh for those of you uh, who were familiar with that. Uh, that was about an 18-month 18, 18 exercise of in and out. Not particularly easy. Uh, to start a large collaborative research centre under those circumstances. But I'm really happy to say that uh, the group that we have is absolutely amazing uh, and pulled through that uh, with flying colours. So we're, we're sort of two solid years in uh, and not quite yet at the halfway point and we think the best is yet to come. So getting a bit more into the content and uh, the things that you probably expect that we would be researching in an organisation that has a title like Building 4.0 CRC is that we obviously think in the future that this is the way that buildings will be made. Uh, this is going to be no surprise to you. But to do that, we also maintain that we need a different method of problem solving and that I think some of the previous attempts to change the building industry have been, in my opinion, too focused. Uh, it's logical to be focused because they are such big uh, expansive problems, uh, but in my view it's very difficult to change the industry if we're not changing multiple things at the same time. If we're not focused on new business models and regulation or if we're not focused, as Martin says, on the customer, uh, then we're not solving the right problems. We're creating solutions in search of problems. So our approach uh, focuses on these four major areas. Again, I don't think this would be a surprise to anyone in the room. Uh, it's not meant to be surprising. Uh, it's around people, culture and practices. It's around improving sustainability. It is industrialization and it is digitalization and all of the technologies that come along with that. To do this, we took a, what I think is a rather unique approach, uh, which was not to just gather as many partners as we could, but to gather partners that occupied a very particular point on the building value chain and to only have a few partners on each of those points so that we were covering off the entire building value chain, a best in class, if you like. And so this slide brings it all together. At, at the heart is this new way of working, this new building life cycle. Uh, and at the heart of that is, an, is a new industry platform about which I'm sure we're going to hear a lot today. Uh, wrapped around that is this best in class ecosystem and together we think we can achieve some of the benefits that you see rippling out from that. We're off to a flying start. Uh, this slide's way too small for everyone to read, but I would definitely encourage you to go online to Building 4.0 CRC and check out the, the large number of projects that we've either completed, that are active, or that are in the pipeline. Uh, we've completed already around 30 projects. There are around 20 active at the moment and another 25 in the pipeline, which include uh, our first wave of lighthouse projects, of which we're really, really excited. Uh, one is uh, underway at the bottom, as you can see, Lighthouse Project 6, uh, and a further um, eight or so uh, in the pipeline. So now on to, I guess, what you could see as the main course for today. Um, I uh, am going to approach this in three uh, different parts by asking where are we, uh, where are we going, and then obviously, as I've already intimated, uh, how we're going to get there. I should also point out that this is the topic of a book uh, that I'm writing and this is the exact structure that I'll be pursuing in that book. So starting with where we are, I really don't want to belabor this slide. Um, I have seen so many presentations in my time that, that remix these exact same words. Um, I think we know by now what the problems are in the construction industry, but I sometimes joke you can throw a dart and you're going to hit a problem in the construction industry. Uh, they're, they're thick and, and many on the ground. But one of the things I think that is less um, widely understood is exactly how those problems uh, are related to the industry structure. Uh, they are systemic. Uh, how could anything else but those results come forth with an industry structure that looks something like this cartoon? And I'm aware that this is a cartoon. Um, 
Things only get worse, of course, when you introduce the supply chain into this, a structure that would be wholly unacceptable to any other industry except our industry and the exceptionalism that we tolerate in this industry for reasons uh, that I'm still perplexed by after 10 or so years. Here's an image of a traditional value chain, which many of you would know if, if, if it was indeed accurate, it would be much, much wider and much, much deeper. But what we're seeing here is something that's incredibly linear and incredibly fragmented. Uh, and then we turn to the process that we have in the construction industry and we see the same thing. Uh, very little continuity of knowledge between inception and operation of buildings. Uh, and uh, as a result, no learning from project to project. So to summarize that, we're dealing with a fragmented industry. It's got margins on margins. They are low margins, high insolvencies following on from that project to project. Uh, but guess what? Low overheads. And this is one of the reasons that this persists, particularly in a country like Australia, and commensurately low innovation. So where are we going? And this is the part that I said before that I think we might agree on to around 80%. So I'd really love to test that because perhaps it's much less than I think it is. An improved building industry. And when I think of an improved building industry, I think of the uh, tremendous advances that have been made by countries like Sweden and Japan. Um, we might throw in uh, Austria and Germany and even Switzerland. Uh, that was for you, Martin. Um, uh, these are the countries that have industrialised. Uh, these are the countries that have manufacturing in their DNA uh, and where manufacturing is a high percentage of G GDP. They have successfully vertically integrated. They have successfully integrated their processes. They have developed product platforms. And I noticed Gustav here in the audience who's probably forgotten more about platforms than, than I'll ever know, but uh, uh, it was, it's been wonderful working uh, with the team in Sweden to understand more about some of these things. Uh, they've integrated their supply chain very successfully. And so what we have in this improved building industry uh, is this pipeline model that's less fragmented with fewer margins and higher margins, uh, repeatable projects, continuous improvement, all of these things. But, and here's the rub and here's the lesson for a country like Australia, and I'm going to say parts of the USA, they have much higher overheads. Uh, and it, uh, given that innovation of these companies is driven mostly internally, it's a very moderate uh, and slow developing um, innovation that we see in those countries. Many of the companies that are highly successful and that we point to have been developing for decades. Uh, and in Australia, we have companies that have tried to go down this path and do this within two or three years. And this is a very difficult and steep challenge that leads to the incremental scalability that we see of some of these more industrialised processes being applied in countries like Australia. And so we asked ourselves the question, what might an unlock be for a country like Australia or indeed other parts of the world that don't have this high proportion of manufacturing in their uh, um, economic DNA. And not surprisingly, I turned to the idea of platform business models. Um, the, uh, this is obviously a diagram that's been adapted from um, business studies and, and people who know a lot more about the intricacies of this. But what lies at the heart of every uh, platform business model is really connecting producers and consumers in more and new valuable ways. We all know by now that those platforms work better at scale and there are many different intermediaries that make them work. And so we asked ourselves the question, how might this look uh, in construction? And so about five years ago, we, we drew a d diagram that looked a lot like this and, and I was really interested and buoyed um, in what was perhaps a hypothesis back then by the different presentations that we saw last year at CFI where I think in the afternoon session that I was able to, to join around three or four companies uh, were all presenting different methods for the way that they were using uh, different value chains and different business models that were similar to this. And so that's why I think uh, on the most part we're beginning to agree uh, on the different ingredients. So obviously this value chain gets better if every company already has 
a, a product platform within it. Um, and I'm really interested to see Murray's presentation after this because uh, I wonder if his experience shows that every one of those suppliers, in fact, do have a highly sophisticated digital or product pl platform behind their, uh, their process. So what have we got? We've got a platform business model, not a pipeline business model. Uh, we've got fewer margins on all of these different data units that flow between the different connecting parts, repeatable projects. But here, I think, is the uh, interesting part. We've got, in my view, higher innovation because suddenly you start to have innovation that's driven both internally and externally. Yeah? No longer are you on the hook for anything that involves innovation. And the lower overheads of this model, uh, I think, are going to lead to rapid scalability. And that's particularly valid in countries uh, like Australia, as I say, that don't have um, a high degree of sophistication in their manufacturing industry. But we've kind of been here before, right? Uh, there is a deja vu. There is a, uh, a trope of the ever brilliant idea uh, that sadly wasn't implemented exactly as it should have been and didn't achieve its full outcomes. Uh, and so when thinking about industrialized building, I, I always come back to this, um, this sentence. Uh, and in putting together this presentation, I thought it might be worthwhile to go back and look at some of the early attempts that, that we've worked on and some other people in this room, like Helena Lillo, who's also giving a presentation later today, worked on. And that's a book that was published also around five years ago on prefab housing um, and building. And this book really set as its intention uh, or tried to draw a line, if you like, under this idea that of industrialized building being a perennial good idea that never really achieves its, its maximum result. Now, I understand that not everyone's going to run out and buy this book, and so I prepared the one-minute summary, which says that uh, prefab or industrialized building, as we prefer to call it, uh, looks really simple on the outside, but guess what? It's not. So don't approach it like it's really simple because you're going to fail. Uh, the, the next thing is there isn't one um, right way to do prefab. Uh, there's just many, many possibilities. And you have to be very, very specific about which of those possibilities you're going to choose uh, because they're not all the same and they don't all lead to the same place. And finally, as you might expect, you need some fresh and balanced thinking if you're going to approach this. You can't keep pulling it out of the, the ideas drawer every five years and recycling it and hoping for a different outcome. Uh, so we need some fresh and balanced thinking. And of course, we need research, which uh, I think this group is really well poised to deliver. Uh, and so just to summarize, uh, we listed out no, no, no less than 17. We probably could have kept the list going a bit longer. And if you study this list for long enough, you'll probably find some extra barriers to success. I'm not going to go in detail into these today. I think that's a different topic. Uh, but I will say that this has been a very pivotal thing for, for myself and our group to try to understand in great detail exactly what's led to the outcome that we find ourselves in with industrialized building in Australia and in other parts of the world. So in bringing all of that together, where do we think we're going? Uh, I personally prefer not to, and, and what you won't see in this lecture is, is a strip list of technologies um, that we think are going to be the, the big unlock. Um, that's not the approach that I personally have. Um, and it's not because I don't think those technologies hold great value for the future. Uh, it's just that I think there's a, a, a lot of risk involved in, in placing them at the centre of our innovation approach. So what I prefer to do uh, is to focus on what we might call characteristics. In fact, it's probably better to refer to these as values or qualities of the future industry. And it's against these 10 characteristics of the future industry that I would like to measure the scenarios and the different ways that we might get into the future. And the Cliff Notes version of this slide is really, if you see it on the screen, then it's not very prevalent in the current industry. I think it's pretty clear to say that we don't really have uh, a highly predictable industry. We don't have a particularly responsible industry. It's also not particularly collaborative, uh, and it's certainly not simple. So how do we get there? 
it won't be a surprise to you by now to understand that there isn't one right way in my humble opinion about how we get there, but there's going to be very, very many. Uh, and today I'm going to try to outline some of those to you. Uh, already our team, this is a slide from our team in Australia, is taking some of these different leading companies and trying to place them on a spectrum of the different approaches to the platforms that they use. Um, but at its heart, I would say that many of these uh, companies and many of the things we're seeing are really a combination of these two ideas. Yeah? They're a combination of the idea that there is a new building life cycle that will become the mainstream and that whether we call it a new operating business model or whether we call it a reformed value chain, that somewhere in between with different mixtures of these will give us very, very different results for the way the future looks. Um, before moving on to some of those uh, different ways that we might get to the future, I would just spend um, 30 seconds uh, talking about some personal experiences of doing research in this field uh, with industry partners and what I would call the changing shape of building innovation. And by that I mean that 40 years ago, I think if we were at this conference, we would have all been talking probably exclusively about the opportunities involved in industrialization alone. Uh, and then if we went 20 years ago, we would have been all extremely excited by the new digital technologies and BIM and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and that today, if I'm not being too outlandish, we might be very fascinated by the new business models and technologies and marketplaces and exchanges and all of those sorts of things. And I think underlying these uh, ideas is a kind of orthodoxy that perhaps the way into the future is like a, a train line on which the stops are industrialization and digitalization and then moving into some of these um, uh, new business models where, where those two trends can, can, uh, can intermix. Uh, that's not what I'm seeing at the moment. I think the, the path into the future is a zigzag, it's circuitous, it's back and forth and it's iterative. Uh, and that I no longer think that uh, industrialization and digitalization per se are necessarily the precursors to moving into uh, a valid future of building. I do think that having, for example, adopted a new business model or a new value chain in the construction industry, it would be hugely advantageous to do so with a strong industrialized building methodology uh, and in a highly digitalized environment. They are certainly advantages, but I don't see them anymore as a precursor. And so what I'm going to do now, with your permission, uh, is describe three different scenarios. And I'm going to take a slightly different approach to do this. Uh, these are things that are of great interest to me, and I've thought long and hard about the best way to bring them uh, to an audience. Uh, and so in a sense, these are almost like alternative endings or alternative plot lines uh, for the industry. Um, and they are almost like three small scripts, which I'm going to read to you now. Uh, these are summarized out of the book, and each of them lasts about three minutes. So I would ask that you bear with me. Our first uh, future scenario is um, the authoritarian. Now this is exactly what you think it is. It's a state, it's a country, and it's not democratic, or at least it can't be voted out. Now whether it's uh, ruled by a regime, the military, a monarch, or a self-styled autocrat, I think the authoritarian state is a formidable force for change. The next one probably needs very little introduction here. Um, it's very close to home. Uh, but I would point out that big tech also exists or is beginning to e exist outside of the US, or at least large tech. And finally, we have the incumbent. Now, for the purposes of this exercise, the incumbent's a large, long-standing company that's involved in all parts of the building industry, from investment, uh, development, construction, and operation. Um, obviously, they're mostly based in a particular country, uh, but they also operate internationally. So let's begin. Let's begin with our authoritarian. 
The authoritarian state's key building problem was the reliance on large numbers of low-skilled, poor and often migrant workers. This posed a medium-term risk for the stability of the country. Building methods were particularly antiquated and building sites were dangerous, dirty and tended to ferment a certain social disorder. Many materials could not be sourced locally, causing supply risks. The national plan demanded that all industrial sectors achieve material and manufacturing sovereignty within 10 years, and if this could not be achieved, strategic relationships needed to be established. Demographics provided another premise for change. Urbanising and ageing populations demanded more housing with more diversity than ever before. These problems led to an unofficial housing supply crisis. Finally, the authoritarian's policy for environmental sustainability lent further weight to the overhaul of the country's poor performing building industry. Government officials summarised the key objectives of the Better Building Program as safety, sustainability and, importantly, control. The authoritarian had at its disposal the, all the faculties of the executive. They controlled the workforce, regulation, investment, markets and international trade. This enabled a flip of the switch approach to its rollout that the authoritarian's democratic counterparts could only dream about. After a 12-month notice period, the government flipped the switch. The following 12 months were slightly chaotic as companies and bureaucrats tried to digest and implement these changes. Given the focus on labour, material and manufacturing sovereignty, government officials focused on industrialisation, establishing regional hubs to manufacture building components and developing processes, systems and products to bring them all together in buildings. Owing to the clarity and absoluteness of the new rules, within two years all government, quasi-government and outside companies had transitioned to meet the new requirements. And within three years, the first wave of buildings were already complete. After five years, the government's plan went better than expected. So much so that the annually increasing volume of completed buildings soon became synonymous with the, with the success of the regime. And the productivity jump became a point of pride, stilling any remaining dissent caused by the unofficial housing supply crisis. A great deal of manual labour was still required, but the move to more systema systematic and industrialised processes had ended the former reliance on outside labour forces. Yes, the housing that was developed was highly standardised, but every citizen was eligible to apply for one. Achieving material sovereignty proved a more difficult task. Much of the raw materials were still imported, but local building products manufacturing industry had sprung up that could transform them to supply around 80% of the industry. With five more years, government insiders boasted this would reach 95% leaving only highly specialised and luxury products to be imported. Big tech. As big tech companies matured, their exponential growth eventually slowed. Shareholders grew restless, knowing large growth demands large markets. Some big tech companies entered healthcare and others trained their sites on the second largest pie, which we all know what that one is. Enthusiastic pitch decks revealed a sleeping giant of the global economy, target rich and underdeveloped. Having started whole markets from scratch, big tech looked across the vast expanse of the building landscape and mouthed three words, low hanging fruit. But if big tech was still not completely convinced about investing in building, the clincher came from a premise closer to home. Big tech had grown so quickly that the burgeoning workforces, offices and infrastructure could hardly keep up. This became a huge risk, further complicated by the fact that big tech's hubs were based in places where property and the cost of living were exorbitant. And so, big tech entered the fray with project, and I apologise, Xanadu. Big Tech's entrance was highly capitalised and to great fanfare. With the deepest pockets in town, how could the future hold anything but unbridled success? The team's initial focus was on a universal system for housing and offices and a modified system for data centres. 
Encouraged by early results, big tech stellar team spends even more time in the lab perfecting their designs, sensing that complete triumph was well within reach. However, the team failed to engage early with mun municipalities and regulators, causing severe headaches and substantial delays for their planned rollout. Always agile, the team's workaround was to partner with a local forward-thinking developer and builder who had deep knowledge of building delivery. This was not a bug, but a feature, as it allowed the team to spend more time developing their beloved software platform. As a software native, Big Tech demanded business cases proposing splitting off the software business. A civil war quickly began between the hardware and the software teams. Big Tech's results were more modest than anticipated. The universal building system was sophisticated and inventive, but it was also more expensive and idiosyncratic, rendering it unwieldy for the existing industry. Faced with long, expensive product development timeframes, Big Tech mothballed the hardware team. Software survived. Although it was far from a going concern, the software business elicited great interest and was spun off. Their products did not match the early end-to-end -end proclamations, but they solved valuable industry problems and had a future. Big Tech's biggest result, however, was neither its software nor its hardware. Rather, it was the realization of its critical position in the building value chain. By owning what had previously been a liability, Big Tech closed a critical feedback loop demanding its processes and standards were met and learning more about how the organization used and valued its buildings. As Big Tech was highly adept at monetizing this newfound data and knowledge, it led to an unexpected windfall. Last but not least, the incumbent. Always wary of disruption, forward-thinking boardrooms demand investment in innovation. Riding high on successive building booms, the incumbent's board felt it had become complacent, with little distinction between it and its rivals. None of this was new to management. Industry innovation had been stagnant for years. On the development side, there were few opportunities to differentiate its offerings. On the construction side, the industry was, raced in a lock, in, uh, was locked in a race to the bottom. Incumbents unable to compete with upstart companies that could underbid and flirt with insolvency. New regulations around decarbonize, decarbonization put the incumbent in an invidious position. Being an investor, developer, builder and operator, the incumbent was on the hook for actual carbon reductions and not the feel-good carbon offsets that the rest of the industry had access to. Apart from the board's hobby horses, the incumbent was literally swimming in risk. Labour and supply chain shortages and the ever-looming threat of industrial action added weight to management's decision to launch its building innovation unit. Worldly enough to know how the large incumbent trying to be a startup story ends, investment in the new entity was limited and it was held at arm's length from the parent company's crushing gravity. Enjoying their newfound freedom, the new team were jubilant and purposeful, finally able to stretch their wings with designs and prototypes. It didn't last long. Every product and process they developed needed the parent company, its people, its pipeline, and its networks. Without them, they'd end up stranded in the lab, like the team from Silicon Valley. A reset was ordered, and collaboration was at its heart. Having watched both big tech and the authoritarians' approaches closely, the incumbent realized that the flip of the switch approach would never work and that early testing in the real world was absolutely critical. The solution was to start by incrementally infusing the incumbent's pipeline projects with its innovative products and its new digital processes, first 2%, then 5 and so on. What the incumbent's steering committee hadn't anticipated was how much the industry around them would change in only five years. Although the team had only managed to infuse projects with around 30% of their products and systems, it was more than enough to differentiate their offerings from rivals. 
This was most evident in the rivers of government work that flowed to the incumbent, one off the back of its improved reliability, a function of its new supplier and workforce accords, its environmental credentials, and quality assurance. These became critical differentiations after regulators were forced to crack down on deficient building practices that followed several high-profile catastrophes. But the crown jewel of the venture was its ecosystem. Unlike big tech, the incumbent took the industry with them. It engaged with all of its suppliers from day one, forging strong partnerships and a collaborative approach. With long-term supply agreements in place, finally suppliers could begin to undertake their own internal innovation programs, leading to the often touted, long-awaited, but seldom found continual improvement. So, and so it ends. So if you couldn't tell, I had an enormous amount of fun uh, writing those pieces. <laughs> And I, I, I don't want to inspire fear in you by saying that there's another 10 of those. Uh, but I think, as you can see here, uh, this is not a straight line to the future. This is a zigzag line. There are lots of back and forth, lots of looking at what the competition is doing. And I don't think strategy ever goes as a straight line, frankly. Uh, but hopefully what you've seen today can show us how perhaps with the use of fiction, we can unlock some new possibilities. Uh, to use Yerka's uh, term, if we all agree on the ingredients, uh, what we're really missing at the moment are some real recipes for the way we put those ingredients together and how we get into the future. And today I've tried to elucidate just three of those different scenarios. Uh, I would also point out before closing that um, the ecosystem model there that I haven't gone into today is probably best represented by RCRC, bringing together government, industry, uh, and research, peak bodies, skills and training organisations to collectively, if you like, bring about the kind of change that we want to see. So thank you so much for that. I'm really looking forward to seeing the rest of the presentations today and learning all of the different ways that you think we're going to get into the future because I think they're all valid. Uh, and again, I thank you for the invitation. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I'd love to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Matthew will also be sitting on our panel later. But if we have one or two questions from the audience, we do have time for those. Right here in the front. And please introduce yourself as well. Hi, uh, Anthony Houck from High Bar. Um, do any of the other seven scenarios have as good an outcome as the authoritarian scenario? <laughs> uh, before I answer that and get in trouble, I'll say that, um, look, in a trip that I undertook last June to Europe, I was uh, very impressed, I would say, um, and I don't mean impressed as in I was pleased, I was very struck by how much the, the, how much the word authoritarian had entered into the discussions that I was having with different research groups around the world. It was against the backdrop of the Russian invasion uh, into the Ukraine, which was a very neighbourly affair for most of the countries that I was, I was visiting. But there were two sides to that. One was the fact that most of the groups I was visiting were asking themselves the very real question of how on earth are we going to decarbonise? How on earth are we going to achieve these targets by 2030 or 2050? Uh, and strangely, within that discourse, the word authoritarian came up quite a bit because it was felt that democratic institutions didn't have the tools or the faculties to make the kind of striking change that we need uh, in order to achieve those goals. And so, in a way, to answer your question, that's where the authoritarian one came from. Yes, they could uh, very quickly um, uh, flip the switch and, and move to that future. Um, yes, is the quick answer to your question. Uh, the other seven uh, will be written such that they triumph very easily over the uh, authoritarian regime. Uh, because obviously that reflects my own personal politics. But I, I do think there are ways to do this. 
uh, without that heavy handedness. But I also think it's interesting for us to look at those countries. They make up a large part of the world uh, and building innovation isn't limited to um, you know, advanced um, economically developed countries like our own. One more question. Maybe I'll take the opportunity to ask one. So what would be your advice for uh, people here in the US, so I come from California, and uh, would dream about such a research and industry uh, collaboration with such a level of government funding uh, uh, and government policymakers also engaged. Uh, what would be your advice for how a, how a community could, could go down that path or, or what would be the, the, the key challenges in setting something up where it doesn't exist? Um. Well, I'm not as familiar as I used to be with the, the funding mechanisms here in the US, so I can't speak specifically to funding programs from government. But I, I think uh, perhaps the lesson I've learned is to bring together a group that's very like-minded, um, and that's probably a group uh, like the one assembled here today from industry. I'm not sure if there are any people from government here, uh, but certainly from research. Um, Collaboration is going to be absolutely key. I don't think any of these scenarios that we see on the screen here are likely to work without collaboration. I, I, you might see the, the solo entrepreneur genius is not one of the, of the routes to the future here because I honestly don't believe that it's a possibility. Um, so how to put that together? Like-minded people doing that in a collaborative way I think the research methodology that, that our group have uh, developed uh, down in Australia, which treats partners with respect, uh, that, that encounters them and their problems on, on their terms, not on our terms and not with our crazy words and phrases and, and, and histories. Uh, I think that's a huge part. And, and also the other thing that I always say is that behind every great innovation program are some great relationships. So I can't underestimate exactly how important relationships and human connections uh, are in this industry. They are absolutely pivotal. It's not something you can do sitting in a corner quietly in a lab on your own. Good. So we, uh, we have one more question. Quick one. Yeah. Hi, this is Vivin. I'm a GP at Zakua Ventures, an early stage construction tech fund. Usually the optimal scenario is a balance between the different scenarios that you show. But what typically happens is they're not in sync. The maturity levels on progress on each of these fronts is very, very different. How do we make sure that there's better alignment from a timeline perspective? Right? And when it comes to regulatory authorities, the incumbents and tech and everybody works together, what, are the, what ideas could work very well there? Look, you know, the question, if, if I'm understanding it correctly, is like, what's the correct path? Um, I think by showing you 10, I'm, I'm trying to put in a bit of insurance because if I said there was one that didn't happen, I'd be on the hook for that. So as a former historian, I'm, I'm wary of doing that. Look, I think different companies, different ventures have different sets of capabilities embedded in their DNAs. So there isn't one rule for all. We have to take each of these ventures and the problems they're trying to solve and the markets that they're reacting in on their own terms, not on our terms or some external um, rational framework. Right? We have to take them on their terms and then we can analyse them on how well they are executing along that path towards their chosen stated goals. And we might question what the stated goals are or who the customer base for that particular product or company might be. That's a valid question to take. But I think they do need to be uh, analysed on their own terms. So I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all answer to that question. I don't think there's a perfect mix of regulation and, and policy and finance and uh, all of these other different pieces. I think it's dynamic and it needs to be, um, you know, I, I hasten to use this word agile uh, in this place, but it needs to be a very agile process where you're constantly checking exactly what the results are and what you're doing and, and that feedback loop. Good. Thank you very much, Matthew. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>